the, the key point is ultimately the need to do something new and not to keep doing the things we've always done. Uh, the economic climate that we're in means that we are fundamentally going to have to do public services differently in the future. We've got to make many more difficult choices and that means just trying new things all the time. It means taking a bit more risk, um, failing faster in one sense, trying things out. Some things won't work but being honest about that and dealing with that and ultimately a much more engaged way of dealing with people because ultimately all we have really are our people. We have a bit of money but mostly we have our people and if nothing else I'm trying to show that how we manage and look after people is as important as any stuff we buy. If you take two organisations delivering the same sorts of services to the same sorts of people, the one that performs better isn't the one that pays the most, um, it is the one where people feel listened to, valued and are clear about what the organisation is trying to achieve. I'm here for, another, for about an hour or so with you and um, most of what I have to say is the bleeding obvious. Uh, and I think the question is, and I always have to ask myself this when I hear myself saying it, is just to remind ourselves or ask ourselves sometimes why we don't do the bleeding obvious more often. And it's usually because some other idiot is stopping us. Um, but the question we should just ask ourselves is how, how many times is it because some other blithering idiot is stopping us doing it and how, how much it, sometimes is it us uh, perhaps stopping ourselves doing the bleeding obvious or being too busy to notice that we're not doing the bleeding obvious. Um, and I just endorse everything I saw earlier uh, in terms of your model of leadership because I think uh, you know, the data that I'm going to show you today I think does bear that out. There are loads of slides. We're going to have a, have a few slides and then we'll have a chat, partly because I've, I've been sitting in bed with a cold all weekend, so I'm going to run out of voice at some point. But um, if you want the slides, if you email ben.page at ipsos.com, they will whiz their way magically to you, so you don't need to write anything down unless it's very uh, witty and charismatic. Um, also, I'm on Twitter, so if you think this is rubbish, you can go onto Twitter at uh, ben at ipsos and say it's rubbish, or you can say it's great or anything you like, and we'll, um, we'll have a chat. Um, so as I'm, as I'm a statistician, this is a good number to start with. What about this number? Any suggestions as to what this might be? Okay, now that's much too low, much too low. You cynics, I know we're in Wales and they didn't all vote for him, but even so. Um, uh, what else? Any other suggestions? P pay rise? A 6% pay, God, people would give their right arm for a 6% pay rise. Uh, that's not bad, actually. The, in, in, by 2017, there are going to be um, 36,000 people over 100 in Britain. And I have good news and bad news on that. Um, only 4,000 of those 36,000 will be men. Um, there will be 32,000 women over 100 and only 4,000 men. So I guess if you're really up for it when you're, and you're male, things could, get, <laughs> things could uh, be interesting. Anyway, no, sad... Sadly, uh, the 6% um, is the proportion of people who um, think that Britain is getting better as a place to live. And uh, most, about 10 times more people think Britain is uh, going down the swanny. Now, I look around and you all seem fed. Um, you all have houses and stuff, and probably much, still more stuff, actually, than your parents in many cases. And you've probably been to many more interesting places than your parents. And yet, somehow, we have this sense that um, we're still uh, one of the top ten manufacturing countries in the world. Our auto industry, our, our aerospace industry is second only to the Americans. And yet, you'd believe, if you believe the papers, does anybody read the papers? Yeah, really, I'd try and try not to do that too often. But... Um, you would generally get the sense that this whole country is going to hell in a handcart. And I want, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting, isn't it? But it is true that we are um, at an interesting point. And I, I think the way we have to think about it, and looking around the room, there are definitely some people who were um, like me. I'm 48. I, you know, I remember getting into university in the early 80s and being so pleased, not because I'd got into a posh university, but just because I knew I'd, because I'd got into this, but I knew I'd be able to get a job. Um, and it's not like that now, actually, but nevertheless, we'll, we'll talk about that because all recessions are miserable in different ways, um, in the same way that all families are miserable in different ways. It's true. And so I think what you have to do, what I'm trying to do, is see the last, the two, sort of 1998 to 2008, just as an odd period of, a, of, you know, a bit of an oddness in Britain, when we had sort of lots of stuff and things like that. And now Britain's going back to the way it normally is, which is a bit shabby, a bit bolshy, um, you know, a bit grumbly, uh, but it's, it's not necessarily the end of the world. Um, 
And I think actually, although, uh, and I was one of them, lots of people were, were sort of very Jer Jeremiah-esque about um, the effects of austerity. So far, and I would stress so far, so I'll come back in two or three years and we'll, we'll talk about what actually happened. But so far, things have turned out better in many ways than I might have predicted three years ago. And we can talk a little bit about that. Um, but it is true that we have this squeeze on living standards. Um, now, fortunately, that squeeze started when we were better off rather than worse off. Particularly interestingly, I was just looking at the data on the way here. Uh, in Wales, whereas 15% of people are worried about inflation and rising prices in Britain as a whole, in Wales it's 21%, which reflects lower incomes, of course, in the first place uh, in Wales to other parts of some, some other parts of the United Kingdom. But we have got that permanent squeeze on living standards. And, and on that, again, you know, we're starting not necessarily, it's not like starting from, I don't know, someplace in rural Africa of a massive squeeze on living standards. But it is true that if you look at median incomes in Britain, they will basically have been flat in real terms for about two decades by about 2020. And so that is sort of going on all around us. Um, but we don't, you know, it's not necessarily absolutely apparent yet, but it's, it's starting to be. We also have a society that's more polarised and more diverse than ever. And that's, that makes your job harder. One of the things that we know is that if you take um, a hospital, take the best hospital in Britain and move it around Britain, uh, same doctors, same nurses, same porters, same oncologists, same consultants, wherever you put it, it will get different ratings and, and the people will be less happy with it or more happy with it wherever you put it. And the reason for that is not so much that the people in the, in the hospital will be performing differently, but the people it serves will have different expectations and may be harder to please. And um, perhaps one of the things about Wales in some ways is some places are quite homogenous, but you're all changing. Britain is getting more and more diverse, and it's just harder to please lots of mixed groups of people. The very best people to serve are nice old white people, um, and they tend to be sort of more grateful. Uh, the worst people to serve, as you'll see in a minute, are young, diverse, um, etc. Some of the worst hospitals in Britain are in outer London. So if you're ever ill, do not go to Newham General, okay, if you're visiting London. Um, but one of the challenges Newham General faces is a very, very mixed population. There are many patients there who don't think women should work. They don't believe women should work. There are other patients who don't believe women should be allowed to wear trousers. There are some patients, you know, there are lots of patients who don't speak English. It's just harder to please everybody. In Newcastle, which has some of the highest levels of public, uh, with public services in Britain, highest levels of satisfaction, you know, what have you got? Emphysemia. What have you got? Emphysemia. What have you got? Emphysemia. It's, it's easier it's easier to serve. So that makes it harder. It also means that we've got to think more about, you know, about, about what we, 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 we do for people and also be a bit, bit more empathetic. We're more feminised, which is good, um, uh, but it also makes sometimes some men uncertain. Could the men who use moisturiser put their hands up, please? Look around. Come on. Now, this would not have happened in the 1960s. Could the women who like fighting on Saturday nights... Um, <laughs> could, could I, no? Well, OK. But, you know... The massive rise in uh, drunken people who've had accidents while drunk on, on Saturday nights in terms of, in, and there is a gender bias in that. Um, we have celebrity culture and instant gratification. We're told, we show our kids TV shows all the time where ordinary kids, just like them, dance around a bit, get a record contract and become rich and famous. And then you sort of, well, well how am I? And you, you sort of sitting there, well, she, I know her, she was just like me, and why, am I, why aren't I getting that? And I think that's a, that's a real challenge. And also this idea of Michael Gove is very keen on this. It's a meritocracy now we live in. Where you come from apparently makes no difference. Now, those of you who listened to the Today program this morning will know that the postcode you're born in actually predicts more about what may happen to you than your genetics or virtually anything else. But the myth we're told is we have both celebrity culture and a meritocracy. And the, the difficulty with meritocracy is that if your life is fairly rubbish, if it's a meritocracy, it's your fault, isn't it? Uh, because, you know, in the old, you know, in, in the feudal period, you know, you lived, in a, you lived in a sort of wooden hut and you ate potatoes and the Lord lived in a big castle and, and ate meat and um, would come down and ravage the village occasion. And then you died and went to heaven because that's what the church you were forced to attend on Sunday told you. And it was sort of, all, it was, had a sort of ordained system. Uh, but now, you know, it, it's, it's, it's really our fault. And I think that's, that can be very, very scary. We're, as a country, we don't trust the people in charge. They've demonstrated absolutely that they're not honest. They can't run an economy. They lie and cheat. Um, and yet, at the same time, we don't necessarily trust ourselves to take responsibility for things. We're a bit like Kevin the teenager, you know, that in sort of Harry Enfield. Sort of, mm, I don't like, don't like mum and dad, but I'm not sure. Do you want to? Oh, no, the big boys might get me. So it's a, it's, it's a challenge. Um, 
Obviously, society, you know, this country is completely, you know, if I leave here now, I'll be sort of rushed by a mob of Albanians or something like that. There's teenagers are out of control. The whole, you know, whole thing's going to hand in a handcart. Interestingly, um, most people do agree with David Cameron that some parts of society are not only broken, but frankly sick. 69% um, of us will agree with that proposition. And, you know, 80% of us will agree that immigration is a major problem in places like Lampeter. Eight, well, well, except they won't say that. They will say 80% will say that 80% will say that immigration is a major problem in Britain. And when you ask them, well, how much of a problem is it in Hackney? About 18% will say it's a problem in Hackney. Uh, probably about the same number as will actually say it's a problem in Lampeter if I go and knock on the doors now. The polls have taken all the jobs or something like that. We have generation gaps in terms of technology. Our kids, my son will not speak to me. I can't get him on the phone. I may be able to sort of BBM him or you know, send him an instant message. But, and that, that has huge implications. And I want to talk a little bit about that because that is a, an area where our children are now living in a world that many of us um, just cannot even relate to. And also an area, and although I, you know, I come from an industry that is changing very, very rapidly, some of you may have read the Sunday Times a few weeks ago where allegedly I was selling 27 million people's mobile phone records to the police. Um, uh, that actually, you know, we need, to, we need to get on top of some of that stuff because it will allow you to do the most amazing things and I think we need, to, we need to think about that. But there will be other people in our community, 8 million people across Britain as a whole, who have never ever looked at the web. Only 23% of working class women over 60, heavy users of public services, have got any access to anything online. And we're, you know, down in Whitehall, um, uh, Frankie Maud, Francis Maud, is talking about putting every single public service, cancelling all publications of any kind, put it all on the web and they will all come. Well, hopefully they have kids who can show it to them because they ain't going to be looking at it themselves. Um, but, you know, certainly, you know, it is, it is a challenge. Um, we know that 50% um, of people would like to interact with the NHS by sending them emails and receiving emails from them. And the proportion who currently do, any offers on that? 1%, 1% currently say they can do that. So how, you know, how do we do that? Um, we have that sort of mixture of some of us in this room will have absolutely no time for anything, and then lots of other people who've got loads of time, but not very much resources. How do we, you know, how do we mix with that, how do we deal with that? We have this problem that I just talked about, the decline of deference. You know, at the end of the um, Second World War, 65% of people in Britain believed that the people in charge knew best. All you had to do was put on a suit, say I'm the, you know, in charge of the local hospital or the council, and they would sort of basically be polite to you. Um, you might try that these days. It doesn't work quite as well, you'll have noticed. Now, there are still 25% of people in Britain who do believe that the people in charge know best. Now, we must find these people. Um, at work, interestingly, even at work, 20% of people will do what they're told. Find them and work them to death, you know, because <laughs> the difficult... Because the difficulty is the other 80%, probably including many of you, that you, know, you won't do what you're told. I've just got a long... I've sold my company um, eight years ago to the French. We used to be called Mori, and we're now called Ipsos Mori. So uh, as part of getting some money from the French, as I call them, I've, I've renamed our meeting rooms, actually, Agincourt, Waterloo, Cressy, and Trafalgar. <laughs> but um, as well as now being, being a French company, one of the things the French like to do is send out long emails with lo lots of instructions about you know, who, who you might hire, who you might not hire, who you should fire. I employ 1,100 people in London. But they, I get these instructions from an accountant in Paris. You know, and obviously, do I do it? Do I? Yeah, yeah, so. Anyway, um, but it's certainly uncertainty. Um, polysensuality, we don't have time to talk about now, but in the break, if you come and see me, I'll explain it to you. Um, uh, and one thing we do know, of course, and you will be dealing with, is that we're all living a bit longer. We all weigh more. Um, as every decade goes by, humanity gets bigger and bigger. So does its pets, actually. It's quite interesting. If you, if, um, your, your pets, the pets seem to have noticed that we've had an extra portion of chips. And um, the pet, pet weight actually goes up in line with human weight. I don't know. You know, you know they say people start to look like their pets. But um, it, it's certainly an issue. But in, in all seriousness, of course, we now have the, many of the diseases of prosperity. Um, I went to get my, you know, I now have to, every time I go anywhere near my GP surgery, they grab me, take my blood pressure, take my cholesterol level, which is sort of through the roof, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So some, some, real, some real challenges. And I think all of those things together, despite still being a wealthy country, not as wealthy quite as we were, our purchasing power is diminished, um, but nevertheless, we're, we, things aren't necessarily all, all terrible. Um, and yet, uh, you know, 
we're somehow anxious. And I think that exploring that and understanding that and being aware of that if you're leading teams of people is extremely important. Um, we may be anxious about the future, but the key thing, of course, is not necessarily to transmit that to your people. I have to put on a game face when I go into my office. However awful I know the year is, how many people I know I'm going to have to fire in order to balance the books, the game face. And that's one thing that I think distinguishes, uh, you know, the better. I don't manage it every time, certainly, but it's really, really important because people want some reassurance. And I think, if nothing else, in terms of the data that we look at today, it's how much we as individuals, can difference we can make to people, you know. Um, and that's so important. I mean, Mr. Nelson Mandela, who I hope, you know, is, may recover, may not, but, you know, did he have loads of money? Did he have loads of people? No. But people remember him. And we all know people that are on a smaller scale in our own organisations who make a huge difference because of the way they behave, not because of the huge resources or necessarily pay that they command. So what are those bleeding obvious things that they do that we might learn from? Well, what, those are things that we might look at today. And the challenge in all of this, I think, particularly in, in, in a sense, you know, Obama said it, didn't he? Never let a good crisis go to waste. Given that we are going to have to reconfigure or possibly going to have to reconfigure so many things in terms of what we do, you know, Angela Merkel Merkel's uh, famous phrase, picked up by um, David Cameron. What does she say? She says, Europe. It's great, Europe. 15% of the world's population, 25% of the world's GB GDP, 50% of the world's spending on social services and welfare. Um, and her question, as a, I suppose a right winger, is that sustainable? Now, it might be, actually. Uh, we might be able to manage it. But it's tough at a time when we have to move jobs all the time. My business is in 85 countries now as part of a multinational group and I am constantly making white graduates redundant in London, offering them jobs in Delhi or Singapore, which they mostly don't seem to want, the pay is much worse, and giving those jobs to people in New Delhi, people in Singapore. And that's what the people your pension funds invest in, Unilever, Diageo, Procter & Gamble, are asking us to do all the time because India is a much better market than Britain at the moment. The growth prospects are enormous. There is no growth here. So we're going to have to find some new things to do in terms of how we deliver services, but also as a country in terms of what we do, you know, what clever things we're going to do that they can't do in New Delhi. Now, many of you involved in public services, one of the great things is it's very hard to do many of your jobs in New Delhi. Um, you know, when you're out there actually delivering the services, somebody's going to have to do that. In terms of doing market research, you can do it anywhere in the planet now with the internet, uh, and that's a challenge that I face. Um, but interestingly, despite all of this, despite all of the cuts, despite 76% of people saying they wish the government's cuts were not um, you know, as fast and as deep, this is a question we ask every month. And we ask people, what are the biggest problems facing this country? We don't prompt it, we'd ask them to answer it in their own, in their own words. Uh, and you can see anxiety about the NHS. It's gone up a little bit this month, as we heard that you know, they're all, you know, I don't know, covering up things at uh, in particular hospitals, but much less worried than, say, uh, 15, 20 years ago. Um, and instead, they've become worried about crime and then a bit less. Immigration and race and immigration. Although, of course, immigration, bizarrely, now, and with the concept, is actually going down. Concern is going up. We can talk about why that might be. Looking, I don't know how many UKIP voters there are in the room. Okay. Um, and, of course, then this anxiety about the economy. Unemployment, um, concern about unemployment is there. Uh, Actually not, you know, it's about, what is it, just 35% uh, just saying they're worried about unemployment. That's below the average of the 1970s and the 1980s. Um, so we're in a huge recession, and we mustn't, you know, when I say a huge recession, it is as deep as the 1930s recession, and it's taking us longer to get out of it. But the profile isn't the same. You know, you go and look, at, look around at our society, there are lots of closed shops, there is unemployment, but anxiety about it during the 1980s, when I graduated on, in the early 1990s, I couldn't jump high enough to show you where it would be on that chart. It would be up in the black stuff at the top. So this is a different sort of recession, characterised by underemployment, characterised by in-work poverty, which leads to you know, some, some real challenges in terms of policy solutions. So, you know, there's um, anxiety about the NHS. There's the Francis report. Uh, but actually, you know, again, it was when Blair said we're under, we've underfunded the NHS for years and we're paying the price for it, uh, that's when concern was, was at its peak. At the moment, despite efforts by all sorts of people to make us very, very worried, we're not so worried, concern about education, any educationalists in the room? Um, 
high. Well, you see, again, Michael Gove thinks you're doing a bad job in Britain, but actually the public isn't too worried. Um, they're not, you know, they don't think it's all gone to hell in a handcart. Uh, and actually, when you ask people what the problem is in education, it isn't sorting out and rejigging all the exams. I guess that doesn't apply to Wales, because Michael's only running riot in England. But, um, you know, they are obsessed, and they would be in Wales as well, about discipline. The kids are out of control. They are revolting. Does anybody actually have a 12 to 16-year-old in the household? Could you put your hand up, please? Wow! Now, that's a lot. Now, you are officially the most miserable people in Britain. <laughs> the data on this is incontrovertible. On, I haven't brought it along, but on every single study, if you look at how happy people are during their marriages or during their partnerships, you will be absolutely your most miserable when your children are aged 12 to 16. But the good news is that things will get better once they leave, <laughs> and um, you will go on getting happier until one of you dies. So there's lots of good things to look forward to. But anyway, so you know, kids are, the kids are revolting, and, um, but we're not too worried about exams. What else? We are, but we are worried. Uh, and, uh, you know, on crime, you know, we still tend to think that crime is one of the biggest issues. Uh, again, we need, to, we need to sort of keep up with the numbers. Um, we currently have the lowest murder rate since 1978. Your chances of being done in are notably lower than for a very long time. Uh, overall crime now is at half the level of the 1990s. You don't read that in the Daily Mail, do you? 54% um, drop in burglary, 60% drop in car crime. This, interestingly, of course, is happening right across the Western world, and nobody quite knows why. One idea is that they're all so busy with their little screens, they haven't got time to go and do anything. But <laughs> either way, either way, it's definitely happening. And so, you know, and, and, and you know, although we will tend to agree with the Prime Minister when he says, you know, it's broken Britain and we need to do something about it, actually, if you look at, do you trust other people? Um, you can see that the Americans uh, think most people can be trusted. They, well, they're most likely to say that. You know, some people might say the Americans are just stupid, but nevertheless, um, you know, the British, the Germans are next. We're in the middle. We're much more trusting than the Poles, the French, or the Spanish. You know, actually, most, most people are okay, actually. It's not, this society isn't really uh, going to hell in the handcart, but you wouldn't believe that, again, as I say, if you read the papers. But on the other hand, we do face some huge and, and very dramatic changes, and those ha have ways of changing... Our, you know, our patterns of existence in, in sort of subtle, in sometimes insidious, mostly positive, um, but nevertheless things that we need to think about. And one is simply that in terms of stuff and, and the web and all of that, I cannot stress enough um, you know, how we're only at the beginning of, of, of this making, you know, making the changes. In terms of where we are with the web and new technology, I mean, I, when I started work, we had two computers in the office, and they were guarded in the, in the 1980s by very fierce women. Men were not allowed near them. My, my essays or reports were given to them longhand, and they were produced, and then I'd come back and check them. And about 1990, I got my own PC. This was very exciting. I was obviously a bit behind the times. Um, and I think in about 92, 91, 92, we had turned on email for the first time. We weren't allowed to look at the web to start with in case we found porn on it, but then we got porn filters, and so we were stopped from looking at that, and we were able to look at the web from about 95 onwards. But the moment we're at at the moment really is like that first PC on your desk, um, and you're going to see this acceleration of change. Um, but it's very, very rapid, and it has very profound consequences. Could you put up your hand if you um, have ever owned a Nokia telephone, please? Okay, now keep your hand if you've still got one. Okay, rather more than usual, but nevertheless. This is the um, speech by the man who took over Nokia, talking about it being a burning, he's on a burning platform, he's got to jump off. Um, but Nokia may go bust, we don't, we don't quite know. Um, still very good phones if you want a basic phone, but the market has moved on. And the challenge is that just many traditional industries are, you know, are changing very, very rapidly, including my own. My job in, in my company used to be, for most of the you know, 26 years I've been there, to find good people and hire them. And in the, my industry now contracts in the same way the print media industry contracts every year. And now I have to find good people and fire them, because only excellent people get to keep their jobs. In the, the good jobs, the good people, get their jobs go to India. Um, and that is the trend that we're, we're facing. And it leads to whole industries, ways of doing things shutting down, 
Um, our high streets will change dramatically. Uh, we may find new uses for them, but again, it's very, very unsettling. And so we're at this, we're like the kid on the diving board, really, just thinking about what on earth the future might be. And, we, and the answer is we don't know. Nokia didn't know a few years ago. I've no idea if my company will be around in a few years. Um, but there are things I think that we can all do, whatever sort of industry you're in, um, to prepare for that. And my favourite word, uh, which is why, even though I'm trying to be upbeat, we don't quite know what will be happening, is hysteresis. Any economists in the room? There must be some... No economists at all. Now, this is a problem, isn't it? Um, OK. If you're an economist, you know exactly what this means, which is basically the long-term and cumulative effects of changes. So the million neets that we have in Britain, not in a job, not at school, not on a course, what happens to them? Do they eventually get a job and grow up and be like everybody else? Well, yes, but... The evidence is from the 1980s and the 1990s that for every year of, a year of youth unemployment, even if you go on and get a job immediately after a year of youth unemployment, you can count the difference in their earning power with those who didn't have that experience of a year on the dole right through their lives until they're in their 40s. It's only in the 40s that the effect of that year of unemployment uh, diminishes and goes away so it's no longer measurable. Um, and so that is a challenge because the young are under huge, huge pressure um, when you ask us, do you think your generation, us, will have had a better or worse time life than your parents' generation? 61% of us still say, actually, looking back at my life, it's better than my parents. 18% say it's worse, but 61% will say it's better. Let's just see how that breaks down. Um, we'll talk about these. So if you were born before the, first world, before the end of the first world, Second World War in 1945, 79% will say things have been better. If you're a baby boomer like me, born between 1945 and 1965, 70% will say it's better. If you're Generation X, born between 1966 and 1979, 60% will say it's better. And if you're like my friend McCoy, who's here today, born after 1980, before 2000, only 42% will say it's going to be better than their parents. 29% will say it's going to be worse. So some real challenges for the young. Um, they are pretty pessimistic about the future, and that hasn't always been the case. In the past, they were often more optimistic. And when we ask people now about what's going to happen to your kids, it used to be before the crash, most people were saying, they're going to have a better life than me. After the crash in 2011... 35% compared to 23% are saying, actually, it's going to be worse. So people are very apprehensive. Now, the good news is that as a country, we're massively, we're always pessimistic. You know, we mustn't, you know, grumble too much. Um, right through the noughties, uh, right up until 2010, when you ask people, do you believe the economy is going to get better or worse in the next year? Everybody always said, even in 2006, when it was running on, you know, whatever, grease lightning in terms of the economy, most people still said it was going to get worse in the next year, and it didn't. But they are, you know, the level of pessimism is a, is a challenge. Um, that is a real, real challenge, I think, that we face. And, you know, we do get that the young might have problems. You know, when you ask people running the FTSE 100 companies, so the people, those people out there running people like, you know, GEC and things, what are the problems? They do talk about the Eurozone, the deficit, the lack of growth. But actually, 13% are talking, they talk about unemployment, and in particular, youth unemployment. So even the people who are all earning an average of 5 to 10 million a year are saying, actually, youth unemployment uh, is likely to be a big, big problem. So we've woken up to that. So the question is, what can we do? There's all those kids who want jobs. We don't have anything for them. Um, we are anxious, but still got quite a lot of computers and iPads and stuff like that, and Nokia telephones. Um, what are we going to do? And one of the things that's interesting is that just expectations are changing. So there's, here's all the pre-war people. We're at this point, you see, as an island, where you've got quite a lot of Generation Ys, born after 1980. There's the Generation Xs, quite a lot of them, quite a lot of boomers, like me. We're a big lump there. And then there's the pre-war generation who are gradually um, dying. But overall, and it's interesting when you look at this, this is the proportion of people who think we should be nice to the poor. It used to be 55% saying we should spend more money on the poor. It's now fallen to 27%, and 43% now disagree that we should do that. But what's interesting, and it may explain why there aren't quite as many student demonstrations as you think there should be when we take away educational maintenance allowance and all the rest of it. Look at the different generations. Every successive generation is nastier in its attitudes to the poor. If you look at the welfare state, the creation of the welfare state is one of Britain's proudest achievements. If you were born 
before 1945, sorry, you can see 70% consistently will agree with that proposition. You're around in your childhood at the time of the beverage plan. You can see there the baby boomers, less likely to agree. Generation X, less likely to agree, and least likely to agree of all, Generation Y. The ones who, in theory, might need it most, actually least likely to think it's a brilliant idea. They're much more individualistic than people who live through that sort of cauldron of the Second World War. So some, some, and I think that, may, again, is another thing that makes it harder. We don't necessarily actually all have exactly the same values. We talk about the NHS being a religion, which it is in some ways in Britain, but some, some real challenges. Now, at the same time, of all of that uncertainty, of course, um, there's some stuff that doesn't really change. Us. What we need to make us happy. Um, and our people, who broadly, although you, you mustn't, mustn't, mustn't ever manage people the way you were managed when you were young, because you will get sued, um, well in my case anyway. <laughs> I mean, the only reason I've stayed in my job for so long, to be honest, was to fire the bastards who made my life a misery in the 1980s, and I did. <laughs> I'm serious about it, almost. I'm very stubborn. Um, but anyway, obviously we'd never do that in the public sector, but this is a vicious <laughs> private sector I work for. What we find when we look at the evidence is that people working in, these are, these are um, outfits as measured by um, individual inspectors. So they're, they're individual inspectors who aren't looking at this data. And what we find is that people in the, one, in the organizations that are top performers are much more like to say they're very satisfied with their job. 33% compared to 18%. These are, these are sort of fairly rubbish at the end here. So that's nice. Money. Money. Money does not make people perform better. Cutting people's pay makes them very cross, but giving them more money does not improve their performance. And I find this a great tragedy. I often mention, you know, my boss often mentions this to me when I have a chat with him about my pay at the end of the year and why, you know, why I haven't had a bonus for the next year and there's no money bonus. You know, so. um, but the evidence is pretty clear. Um, there's just no significant correlation whatsoever with how people feel about their pay and organisational performance, which is good because we haven't got a lot of money to give out in pay rises. Um, so that's, uh, but it's, a, it's something that we see whether we're looking at the public sector uh, and the private sector. Most pay systems seem to be about avoiding trouble rather than anything else. Bureaucracy. Is it that rubbish places just allow themselves to wallow in bureaucracy imposed by crazy loons down in Cardiff or in Whitehall or somewhere else um, and the great ones somehow get rid of all the bureaucracy and just pay no attention to it and do brilliant things? Not really. No evidence much. A bit, you know, perhaps a little bit, but it's, it's not really um, about bureaucracy. There's pay again. We'll skip that one. It's also not about being nice. It's quite interesting, isn't it? Um, are colleagues friendly? 74% in the worst, 77% in the best. Is work interesting? You know, you can be in um, Morecambe Bay, be a heart surgeon in Morecambe Bay or somewhere, and, you know, six out of 100 of your patients die compared to 0 0.6 somewhere else, but you'll still find your work very interesting. If you're in a council that's sort of forgetting to collect the rubbish at the moment, you'll still find many people who say they're working there. It's very interesting here. Um, the working hours, is it that somehow the top performers have made, you know, got everybody to work an extra hour every day to make them more productive? This is the great, you know, our great secret in Britain. You know this, don't you? We have the lowest, some of the lowest levels of productivity in Europe, but we've got round it because we're really clever. So what we do is we're not very productive while we're at work. What we do is work really long hours to make up for it um, so we can beat the, beat the French and Germans who go home early. Um, and the friendliness thing is an, is an interesting one because I, 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 st I have stayed in the same organisation. I should stop making jokes about it, but it's, uh, I was told to be witty. Um, that actually, you know, people don't want David Brent. They don't, you know, you are not their friend. Um, it's nice to be their friend. When I, when I first, because I've been promoted through the ranks, when I first took over one of the divisions, I had about 150 people working for me at the time. And I used to take, this is the vicious private sector, so I used to take them all the pub on Friday night and put the credit card, the company credit card, behind the bar and buy them loads and loads of drinks. And this would make them think I was a jolly good bloke and one of them and how great it was. Absolute rubbish, you know. Absolutely, you know, they'll get, yes, the ones who want to get pissed will go and have, have a free drink, but it does absolutely nothing, and it's, it's not about those factors. So instead, it's many of the things that you've already been talking about. What are those things that we need to think about trying to do? Being told how you're doing. Those difficult conversations that we hate doing. How many of you use 360 feedback in your organisations? Could you put your hand up, please? Okay, oh, good. And how many don't? Okay, well, you need to start doing it. Um, because it's really, you know, this is, a, you know, this is the only way you're going to really know what the hell's going on. People want to know. 
They want to be told. I, make, I have a boss, a French boss, who's about 70 and owns the companies, and he um, sort of smokes goulards like this. Uh, when I took over the job as chief executive, I said, Didier, what do you want me to do? He's called Didier. You know, Didier. Ben, two things. Be yourself, okay, uh -huh. uh, and talk to the private sector. Oh, thanks, Didier. And that's been my entire feedback for four years, and it probably will be until I get fired. Um, uh, which is four years as the average tenure of a chief executive in the private sector in Britain. But of course, what I do is instead, I get, one of my, I get my deputy to go and to get me anonymous feedback from all over, the, all over the company about annoying things I've just done, being indiscreet, you know, all the things that you can see in this speech could be a real problem. Um, <laughs> opportunity to show initiative. You know, we know, we know that we don't make plants grow faster in our garden by nipping down every five minutes, ripping it out, having a quick look at the roots, putting it back down again, saying, off you go, son. Um, but I actually met some people in Merseyside Police. There, there were some um, inspectors who had teams who were dealing with members of the public, and they got very cross about the um, level of literacy of their fellow Scousers. So they decided they would read all the emails before they were sent that these people had drafted. And as you can imagine, productivity and morale were not doing well um, in this place. There's huge, you know, huge battles. So people want, people want an opportunity to, to try out new things. And they, want, they don't want to run the place but they want to feel listened to. And when we, and that's really hard, when we don't know what's going to happen, uh, we aren't sure what, you know, what's the profile of spending we're gonna have. We aren't sure exactly how the services are gonna be configured. We don't know if we're gonna get a grant to do that, but that's what they want to feel, that they have some say in this thing. So it's these things that stand out. Um, telling people what on earth's going on. By the time we're bored, by the time we're sick, sick and tired, sick and tired of trying to explain what we're trying to do here, where we're trying to go. By the time you're bored witless with telling people about this, you will have just begun to get the story across. If you ever hear Terry Leahy, who used to run Tesco, talking about his time at Tesco, one of the things he says is just how fed up he was talking about the Tesco way. You know, every little helps. One of the things that they say in turn is, it's really, what have you done today to get a better deal for our shoppers? And that's the, that's the one thing they talk about all the time. He was bored witless with it. But you need to, in, uh, but if you, you can be damn sure that everybody who worked with him was absolutely clear about it. So, you know, whereas I do work sometimes with some local authorities, you know, so, to, this year is the year of the customer. Well, what's it, what's it like next year? Or the, uh, you know, but, you know, or the, the year of the employee. Well, what's, you know, so, but, that, but making sure you tell people, because look, it's a, what's that, five times higher in the best ones. They do know what's going on. Five times higher. So spending time on the soft stuff really, really matters. Um, consulting people over management decisions. Double in the top performers. So it's not the top performers. The top performers aren't soppy. They tell people how they're doing. But when they decide to shut down your bit and move all the jobs to X, they have actually talked to people about it rather than allowing them to try and work it out for themselves via gossip, innuendo, and everything else. And again, making time for that seems to really, really matter. And this key one here, Everybody, well, if you're, you know, it doesn't matter how rubbish your oncology unit is, the records office is, the benefits office is. Most people say, yeah, I know what's going on here. We've got clear objectives, yeah, process those forms, et cetera, et cetera, deal with those bodies. Only a 20, you know, what's that, a 20 point gap. But a key one in the top performers, they get the big picture. What are we trying to do here as an organization as a whole? 64% will strongly agree that they understand the overall objectives compared to only 26% in the worst, and one of the things that's happened in the public sector in the last three years or so, job insecurity has shot up, shot up. It's more than doubled in the last three years in Britain. But something else has also shot up, clarity about what on earth we're trying to do here, which is probably a good thing. Um, but if, so can we, you know, are we clear about what those things are? What are those three things that you'll always, always do? What are the three things that your organization stands for? You, it has to be simple. People don't come to work to read huge organization manuals that tell them these things. How do we demonstrate those behaviors? We're going to have a short break now while you talk on your tables, and I'm then going to randomly pick some tables to come and talk to me up here about it. So could you have a reflection on some of those things, that, that data that we've just seen, and said, well, what does that mean for you, and is that happening, and if not, why not? Because I think this is the bleeding obvious in many cases, um, but then the question is, why don't we always do that? Because clearly, we don't. Um, I'll come and find you in about five or ten minutes. Thank you.
You've, um, you've probably already started working out that you're going to, as with most conferences and events like this, you'll get as much or more from people you're actually attending the conference with than anybody who actually stands up here talking to you. Is there anybody who wanted to say something? Um, there's too many tables for us to do the standard going around the tables thing and reading it out, but is there anybody who feels passionately that they should say something at this point before I pick on them? <laughs> Nobody feels passionately about saying anything. Okay, all right. Anybody feeling brave? There was one, okay, I, I, don't, I didn't get your name. D. D was saying, well, this is all very well, Ben, um, this stuff about empowering people and listening to them and all this, but um, doesn't the current crisis in many services actually lead to a situation where there's going to be more command and control? Um, and I think that's an interesting, it is an interesting point. If your organization is losing loads and loads of money uh, or is in crisis, then you may not have time to empower everybody to go and um, fix things. And I think, you know, if the patient is on the beach bleeding, having been dragged from a shipwreck, um, you know, empowering them and having a conversation about what they'd like to do next probably isn't going to work. So I think, I think that's right, but it's not, if you default to that mode of, command and control all the time, you will go nuts. Um, and the point, I think, is to get out of that situation to a steady state, the new normal, where we can actually give people the space, the autonomy they need as human beings to actually do their job. But I absolutely agree that some of the stuff that I'm talking about does rather hope that we aren't in a crisis. I have, you know, I ha out of my 1,100 people, they're in six units, and sadly, for whatever reason, partly because the markets were in a changing circle, there's usually one where I have to make sure that there are you know, quite strict controls in place about hiring and firing and all the rest of it. Fortunately, hopefully I've got good people running those things, so I don't need to do that because they know that in this situation we'll need to take out some cost or whatever it would be. But I, I mean, it's, it's a good point. What else? Anybody, I mean, we, we were talking, yep, yeah, go on. Uh, Adele Carhill Shared Services. Just really following on from the point there, it's about permission as well. Too yeah. many of us wait for permission. Well, it's the thing that drives me nuts. I stand with my managers and they're all like, well, we need permission to innovate. And I'm like, you know, if I had waited for permission to innovate, I'd probably still be, you know, doing whatever. So why do people, yes, I'm amazed, but people do feel afraid. Um, and I think, and, and I don't know if that's because it comes, if it's, you know, the fish rotting from the head downwards and therefore it's the bosses are trying to stop anybody doing anything. But I usually find that most people are often desperate for their staff to do something different. And yet, the, I mean, it's the same with my people, and they've, you know, I'm constantly telling them to try something, but they want an innov... We've had to call it a wrapper. We've created a wrapper around a, a framework in which they can innovate inside. My people are mostly statisticians. You know, they're like numbers, counting. They'll sit there like this. You know, I so say, I need you to innovate. Well, I'll go and count again very carefully. Um, but they said, well, in that case, they said, okay, well, give me the framework I can innovate in then. Well, it's just like, you know, there's a, the room is this huge room you can innovate. But people, no, it's true that people want that. But I think we should, I do think there is a mental, you know, and we need to be very, very honest with ourselves um, about the extent to which we, the reason we don't do things are because somebody is stopping us, as opposed to actually, ultimately, we'd rather, you know, get home on time, um, or something like that. And I think there is a, you know, we need to be realistic about that. Um, but it's, uh, yeah, I agree, permission, granting permission. And that's something that comes up, as you'll see in a second, about, about permission to innovate, and actually failure. If we were an IT, if you were all in IT, um, or you were in um, Silicon Valley in America, in California. We would all, and we all start off, we all go there now on a jumbo jet. We'll go down to Heathrow, we'll jump on a jumbo jet. I will give you each, you know, one million bucks to spend on a new business. Loads of people will come and take the money off you. They'll all, and most of these people will be delighted to take the money off you, and most of these businesses will go completely bankrupt. Um, and the Americans don't mind. The whole mindset is, you know, you try four or five things, they all fail, and then you do the last one, and you make loads and loads of money. There's a very good book, and um, in fact, I strongly recommend it. It's a guy called Tim Harford, and buy this book. If you don't like it, the organizers have my name and address. You can send it to me, and I will buy it back from you for double what you paid for it, okay? Because I think it's that good, okay? And um, Tim is not a particular friend of mine. He's a good guy. Okay, so Tim Harford, and the book is called Adapt, and it's subtitled, Why Success Always Starts With Failure. And it's, it's broadly about, he talks about Iraq and how the Americans went horribly, horribly wrong in Iraq 
For the men in the room who like war machines, he talks about the invention of the Spitfire and why it all went horribly, horribly wrong to start with. But the, the point is there about the need in the market and the complexity of the world that we live in, about the need to try new things. So Tim Harford, adapt. Don't like it, send it to Ben Page, get checked for double what paid for it. Okay, because it is good. And I, I've said this at every conference I've spoken at, more or less, for several years, and I've never, ever had one of these books back. So you may be the first people to do that. But it is, it's something you can read on the beach. It's quite well written, and it has some, it's just a useful reminder, I think, in whatever situation we're in, to try something new. Um, one of the things that I did, as well as all those numbers, I spent some time... Um, about 40 hours or so, just talking to different chief executives and leaders. And I, I chose them. I didn't tell them I'd done this, but I chose them again according to whether or not auditors had rated them as excellent, whether or not auditors had rated them as so-so, and whether auditors had rated them as rubbish. Now, interestingly, rubbish chief executives, mostly in Britain, now do get sacked. So I couldn't find many of those, but I could find a few bog-average ones. And in fact, two of the 40 got sacked within a year of me speaking to them. And they were interesting, and there's some, there's some lessons here, right? And I'll tell you about these two people who got sacked. One of them told me, because these are long interviews where I get people to tell me about their life and their childhoods and how they ended up doing this job. Um, and one of them said, well, actually, Ben, you know, actually, at the end of the day, it's just a job. They, somehow they got fired. Nothing to do with me. Another one um, was quite interesting. They ran a county council, and they had a head of policy whose office was opposite their office. But when the head of policy wanted to see them, instead of coming across the office and saying, hello, Jack, are you free? He had to go downstairs, wait in reception until the secretary summoned him back up again to go and talk to the boss. Um, strangely, he got fired as well. Um, so what are the things that the ones who were doing well, what were they, what were they telling us? And I think there's some, there's some very, very clear messages. Um, the first is, now again, it's not about the transactional, you know, you do this, I give you this. It is about that big picture stuff. Um, the ability to communicate and to have a vision and the ability to communicate the cunning plan. The bigger the setting, the more you will find yourself doing that sort of thing. If you've got a team of 10, perhaps not, but a team of 50, a team of 100, 200, 300, you're going to be doing that. Almost every day, wherever you are, whoever you are speaking to, you've got to be using words that provoke an intellectual response to get people to be creative and full of ideas and join you in journeys about what the future could be like. Now, it sounds like this is pie in the sky, possibly, in the environment we're in now. It's like, oh my God, how are we just going to be able to deliver this service with the budget that they've given us this year? But I think the point there is, of course, you know, why do we do the things we do in the way that we do them? Can we do it some, some way differently? And just, you know, just trying to remember that occasionally as we struggle through the spreadsheets is probably important. And this is, again, one, you know, here we are. I'm aiming at a can-do culture where people don't ask permission where people don't ask permission. I'm happy to trust others and be available to them. I am not a control freak. I am not sending emails at 2 o'clock in the morning. Now, actually, I do. But they are not ones telling people to do things. <laughs> They're just, I found something interesting because I'm insomniac, and you might like to look at it. It's not, go and do this, you bastard. Um, you know, how do I operate? Principle number one is a high degree of de delegation. Decision-making should happen to the lowest level, so I let go. So interesting, isn't it? These people are not saying, yeah, I've got a brilliant system. I can tell what they're doing on Monday. I can tell what they're doing on Tuesday. On Friday, I get the numbers. You know, it's, they're not telling me that. They're talking about letting go. And if you are going to do communication, it's not about the very, very detailed implementation plan, which, of course, changes its name. Well, somebody said they've got an appraisal or value system, but they change the name of it every year in their organization. It was over there somewhere. So they're not doing that. I spend a third of my time on partnerships and relationships, a third on visibility, communicating the message, getting our stories across. Now, this is a big organization, but nevertheless, who we are, how we want to do it, and what's our style. And I spend a third of my time on grot. I avoid my office and accounts, as you can imagine, because I just come around and do things like this. I try and do the accounts on the phone in the evening or something like that. Um, but it's much more, you know, and that, but that stuff, the soft stuff, stands out as really, really important. And then the interesting thing is, if you talk to people who have spent 10, 20 years doing this, it's quite interesting, because most people in the public service, you know, very, apart from with some exceptions, have often been promoted because they were a good teacher. So they became a head teacher. They were good at laying tarmac. So they became in charge of you know, a surveyor's department. They were good at sorting out people's housing problems. So they became in charge of a housing department, et cetera, et cetera. You know, my, in my job, you're a good statistician, become a chief executive. Why not? It's obvious, isn't it? Um, and so this is interesting. This guy says, you know, when I started this job, I had no idea the main thing was going to be setting the tone, getting it right, recognizing and rewarding staff. And now I know it's the most important thing I do. He was a planner who found himself ultimately a chief executive, and he thought it would be about, you know, arranging systems and processes. This guy is quite interesting. He stopped, um, 
uh, this, this hospital just going into complete meltdown. And this is your point about um, command and control. If I have one regret, it's that I should have done the softer stuff earlier. I should have brought in a range of talents earlier rather than the hard stuff of driving targets. I had to be tough because of the place, but if I had my time again, I would have trusted people earlier. Um, and so it's interesting, this is, these are people after a lifetime in public service coming up and saying these are revelatory things. So we can learn from this. This does assume that people are competent. It does, it does, this is, none of this is about just being lovely to everybody. This all assumes you have a performance culture, I would just stress, that we are not saying everybody's wonderful and they can all go home at four o'clock having done no work. But it does, but at the same time, you know, this, this guy's interesting actually. He, I, said, well, I said, what do you actually do to me? He goes, well, actually what I do, I put 100 quid in an envelope and then I hear, I'm, I'm, a well, I'm one of the best paid people in this county, he said. So what I do is I put 100 quid in an envelope once a, one, once a month and I give it to somebody I've heard has done an amazing job. And I says, well, did, did this, does this boost morale? And he goes, well, no, but you get damn good service next time. Anyway, so, but it's, but it's that general point about recognition that people want. Random acts of kindness. You know, a smile doesn't cost anything. Um, people do take their, their lead from you. I do a stand-up talk in a room like this um, every, every few months. And if I do a really rough and tough management talk about our ratios, profitability, and everything else, the graduates, the poor graduates, think the company's going bankrupt. So I have to do a nice talk about how everything's wonderful and it's a brilliant brand and everything's going to be great. And then they're all happy and it's, it's all good. But more importantly, you know, find the just unexpected presence. So, you know, somebody does something great, I will send them away for the weekend. Just, you know, that's amazing. Take somebody you really, really like, go away for the weekend and send me the bill. Just, you know, I know that's harder in the, pu in the public sector, you know. <laughs> what did you do with the cash? What did you do with the cash? There must be an inquiry. You know, the Murph or Tidville advertiser wants to know, oh my God, they went on a training course. I mean, my God, what are you doing in here now? Days lounging around, sipping tea. What is this nonsense? You know, my God. And you've got carpets in the office and flowers and curtains. I mean, Jesus. Surely, you know, anyway. But, um, but you know, it doesn't have, they don't have to be monetarily related. Um, but random acts of kindness, I think, really, really stand out. Culture. Again, we keep hearing this thing again. It's buzz. We've got a buzz. That's what people say when they come here. Um, we're upbeat and positive. And I think that the game face, maintaining the game face and being positive, that is part of your job if you're going to be a leader. Um, you, know, you, are, you may feel like misery inside. Your job is not to convey that to your entire team. It is happy, happy, happy within reason. Um, I mean, you can be miserable sometimes. There's a, a great quote, you know, great leaders selectively, selectively show their weaknesses. Um, and, and convince, but, but not every five minutes. We do not want to have David Brent having a nervous breakdown on stage about his midlife crisis or anything else. We can do great things, interesting things with warmth and humility. We don't want to be the best counsellor in the world. We want to be the best we can for our community. Again, so much stuff around culture. Remember that one, culture beats strategy every time. So, you know, and the cult, what is the culture? The culture is the sum of the behaviours that are, are present in your organisation. Passion. This one's quite interesting because not everybody likes strolling up and down on a stage giving speeches and being amusing or not being amusing or anything else. Um, and one of the things I think about that is clarity. That, that you do need to have clarity. You may not be somebody who does stand on a stage speeches, but you need to be bloody clear. So Terry Leahy again. When we had Terry Leahy come to speak at our Christmas party, I thought, great, you know, Terry Leahy, huge businessman, I'll learn loads of stuff, it'll be a great speech, I'll be able to get some sort of riff, riffs I can copy off him, it'll be wonderful. Terry's speech was dire. It's terrible, but the th I, had, I, had, I had supper or dinner with him afterwards, and the one thing you certainly got from him was that there's absolute clarity about what mattered at Tesco, about the things that they were trying to do. So you don't have to be a great speaker, but you do have to be absolutely clear and consistent. People, people want to know what that is. You know, now, they talk about energy, but of course, and he's talking, of course, here about through relationships, relationships being the thing um, that matters. And, you know, a bit passionate. This is a woman speaking, I would just stress. You know, so if I come and check your bodies in a minute, how many of you, how many of you have actually got that tattooed on there? I feel so good about, blah, you know, Rhonda Taff. I've got, actually got Rhonda Taff on my arm, you know. Um, but it's this point about believing in what we're trying to do here. We have a limited time on the planet, unless any of you know the secret of eternal life, in which case, come and see me later. Um, and therefore, we spend lots and lots of that time at work, so we may as well have some fun and try and make it make a difference. And that, you know, that stuff really, really matters. 
risk. That was interesting to me at the time when I did this. I don't know if you can read it there with the lights. To, to, to truly empower, staff need to be allowed to cope and deal with failure. Not succeeding is an inevitable consequence of trying to change and improve. Things don't always work. That was what one of them said. What did another one say? People need to feel empowered to make decisions and get on with it, but you can only innovate if you're willing to cope with failure. In a climate of innovation, the culture itself must be able to cope with failure. Some of innovations do not work. So we're going to try out something new. We'll try a new way of doing Meals on Wheels or whatever it is, and it may not work. So, but then don't have a plan that involves switching the entire service over to your new brilliant idea. You know, start small, scale fast, all of those obvious things. And accept that as we try new ideas that they'll go wrong. I'm working at the moment with a Formula One team. It's a really interesting, and it's with my data scientists. And what we're doing is seeing how quickly we can change the air loin that goes on the front of the car. Now, they've got 10 different teams working on different air loins for different cars at the same time in parallel. And of those, they know that nine, nine are not going to get their air loin onto the car because one will win. And they're all fine about that because the main objective is to get the car. The reason you have 10 teams is because you've only got a limited race season and every, every single race goes 0.2 seconds faster than the one before. And all the teams do this. So it's, no, it's an honourable failure, but they're trying, and, and we can, the faster they can do that, the faster they can fail, they can find the one that works, they can make the, go, the car go faster and they can win. So that's the sort of culture that we need to think a bit about. Charisma, we've talked about, I think I'll skip that. It just means, I think, being clear. It's true that you know, even if you're shy, the one thing is about being there for people. If you've got teams spread around Wales, sitting in Cardiff or sitting in Welshpool or sitting in Bangor, isn't going to be very helpful. One of the reasons why on some of these charts you've seen that a third of people, only a third of people say that they, um, you know, they like the management is because actually only a third of people even know who the management are. Um, and this can even apply in quite small teams. So, you know, get out there. Um, I'll skip that, it's boring. Right, boring, boring, boring. But in all of this, I think some of the things that stand out then is it is about people. And this is one of my, you know, this is Tom Peters, who is the management consultant's management consultant, or one of them of recent years. And I want to talk a bit about Tom later. One of the things he says, soft is hard. What does that mean? It means, sorry? Hey? Exactly. And, you know, we are all rational people, often promoted because we were good at doing rational things, and suddenly we have to deal with humanity, which, as we know, it may be many things, but we are not. None of us are rational. Good God. Who's still with the same bank that they were when they were a student? Please put your hands up. Suckers! You see? We just, that's called the anchoring bias. We just can't be asked to change. Um, but it's stupid. So that's humanity. Um, and what we do need is enthusiasts. He says, you know, if it was my 50,000 quid and your 50,000 quid, we're going to run a cafe together. What sort of waiters do we want? We don't want ones with PhDs. We want enthusiasts. Um, so how can we recruit for enthusiasm? Uh, nothing is so contagious. Let's look at, you know, look at ancient literature. But, you know, as he says, HR, I mean, I, I used to hate HR. Because, um, you know, God, they drive me nuts. They seem to sort of exist in an alternative universe where they, it's all about neat filing and things like that. It doesn't actually need to help you run the business, but it's about do their processes very well, you know. So, but, you know, as he points out, they're actually the coolest people in the business if they do their job properly. Um, we need to find great people. And, of course, that's another thing that we sometimes see, that people are a bit scared of finding people who are better than them. But, you know, the key thing is to find lots of people who are better than you and let them do your work. My aim in life, my only aim in life, is to get my six divisions running so well that I never only have to speak to them once a month. I can just come around, do funny talks, and go for lunch the rest of the time. And I'm, I've been striving at this for years, but I will achieve it in the end. But we need to find, you know, we need to find great people. And that is, if you can, if you can do that, you will, you know, you will find your life is much, much, much better. And then just being there for people. This is, I, this is one of my favourite ones. Tim Brighouse is a, an academic, um, I guess an academic administrator. Once again. And, and he, this is what Ofsted said about him. They said that he was an example to all others of what can be done, even in the most demanding environment, perhaps the one we're in now. I don't know, those of you, anybody worked in Birmingham? Big old place. Well, Tim, when he was there, we were there with Tim. He, the story I love about him is that when he turned up there to start with, the education authority were ringing up the header and going, where the hell is he? He, wasn't turn he didn't, didn't go into the office for the first week, and of course he was spending every morning with a different head teacher. So he hates Ofsted, as far as I can work it out, but they love him. And some of the things that he's doing is, of course, is being there for people, being visible, doing the soft stuff. Um, and, you know, this man had the same idea about 500 years earlier. 
And he is called Baldassare Castiglione. This is a painting of him by Raphael. Um, and this is just concrete evidence that if you do what I tell you, your ancestors, your descendants are going to be rich. Okay? So just bear with me. Now, who's been to see the Mona Lisa in Paris in the Louvre? It must have been a few. We've all been there. Okay. Now, when you go to see the Mona Lisa, if you followed the main route, you'll have gone down a long corridor of paintings, and you will have walked past Baldassare there on your way, and your hurry would to get past the Americans to get in front of the Mona Lisa and take a picture of this picture. There. But this is actually a much nicer picture. But Baldassare lived in the 16th century in a town called Mantova, uh, in Italy, which is a strong, I love Italy, it's a, a great food, some of the best food in Italy, and it's got some fantastic castles in it, which are all empty. Uh, they were run by despots called the Gonzagas, who fell out with the Pope, who then killed them all. So they are extinct. He used to work for them, and he wrote a book, he wrote the first self-help book in history. It's called The Book of the Courtier, uh, the professional uh, member of court, and his job, of course, was to help and advise noblemen on how to get on with very difficult people, e.g. despots who ran bits of Italy. Um, and what's interesting about Mantua is a beautiful empty castle full of paintings by Mantegna and everything else. On the other side of the main square is another beautiful castle, but this one you cannot visit. And on the door plate are the descendants very happily living there with their book, which was published in 22 different languages and has never gone out of print since he first produced it. Um, the descendants of Baldessaria, they're still there. So learning how to get on with difficult people, being there for people, um, really, really makes a difference. I wouldn't read the book. It's written in sort of rhyming couplets, um, which is a bit heavy going, but the principles are the same. And the stuff is ultimately that, you know, what we do matters. Um, this is the same data rated by the auditors, rubbish, fruit, or excellent, and it's interesting, this is the number who disagree that the people in charge have a clear idea about where the organisation's going, or they have confidence in them. And as you can see, the average in the common herd, typically in most public sector organisations, a third will be saying, actually, I don't think they know what the hell they're doing. Bloody useless. A third will probably say, yeah, the, the vision values thing sounded quite good. Another third will say, I don't know what it is, I've never heard of them. Um, but a third will actively disagree, except, look at the top performers. Only five people in a hundred would actually disagree that the people in charge know what the route map is. Um, so we might not like it, but we know what it is. And that clarity about where we're trying to go is something that's really, really important. You know, we've got to keep that clarity. We've got to keep building people's flexibility. We've got to remember to do those random thank yous, even if we can't send them away for the weekend. I guess, what do you do in the public sector when somebody's done? You just promote them or something so we can get them some more money. Uh, sorry? Cake. Cake is good. Um, you know, so we, we really need to keep doing that. I mean, you know, and the other thing is just being aware of the challenges, I guess. You know, sometimes, even when we have less than we had before, Adam Smith wrote the book, you know, The Wealth of Nations, and there's various, you know, things we quote, but I like this one. The great source of both the misery and disorders of human life seems to rise from over overrating the difference between one permanent situation and the other. And a lot of our gloom that I started off with in Britain is because actually it is a bit tougher and we don't have quite as many holidays as we used to. But we're still, it's still sunny, we're still all fed, we're still with good people, and you know, life, life if we make it, will be much, much more positive. I'll skip that one. You know, that is really, really important. You know, what is your story? It's not this. You know, it's not, you know, you don't, you don't, but some of you, some of some people you work for, they believe that if you follow this, then everything will be well. But it really, it's this. And that's the thing that we say, in, you know, when you go, you know, the places that are successful, when you walk in there, people know what the place is about. You know, your people don't need to read a manual because they know that this is what we try and do. This is, they know what good looks like. Um, it's funny, I spent, um, uh, a day with Asda. I used, to, I used to not like Asda very much because my pet, I've got a secret, which is that my family are sort of vaguely socialist, so I don't know what, anyway. So I used to be sort of off Asda because um, Asda and Walmart, which is their parent company, they don't um, allow trade unions. They pay the minimum wage. If they could pay less than the minimum wage, they would, but they're not allowed to by law. And yet, uh, Asda's staff turnover is half that of the average supermarket chain in Britain. Half. Um, they don't have any staff because everybody is a colleague. And it, they genuinely are. And so I spent a day doing something like this for them. And I, they made me go and spend a day in their head office first, because I'd been giving them a bit of this first, as you can imagine. And um, what was interesting was as, as part of that day, the day was spent around five things. Just five things that you will do if you run an Asda store. 
Compare that when I talk to people who run NHS hospitals who, when they count them out, have identified 168 different things that they're, they're asked to all do brilliantly. Um, but these, these guys, five things, you know, you will uh, make sure it's spotlessly clean. You will make sure that the shelves are fully stocked so customers can find what they want. And then you will, and this was an interesting one, every week go and do an at your shop at another Asda store and see how it feels to be a customer in one of our stores. And the other two were about actually listening to your staff and listening to your customers and telling the guy in charge, Andy, what you were doing about it. But, but there they have that clarity about those five things. They're all like, yep, five things. And they do those five things really, really well. So all the time, it's really, I think it's, it's challenging. You know, people talk about you if you're in charge. Um, everything you say counts. If you don't make time for people, they won't just assume you're a little bit busy. Didn't have time to talk to me in the corridor. Didn't have time for my appraisal. Well, rubbish, it means you don't care about them. Um, you know, so that is really, you know, really, really important. We need to, we need to think about that. I'll skip that. Now, the good thing, finally, then, before I wrap up, is that, you know, we are operating in a period of huge uncertainty. I hope that I could come back in two, three, or five years' time, and you could say, well, Ben, you know, you said, you know, you said that stuff about median incomes being under pressure until 2020. You are talking rubbish. Look, everything's brilliant again. The economy's booming. The deficit is paid off. It's all good. But... But the interesting thing is just how, un how much uncertainty there is. And that's back to, these are slides actually from that Tim Harford book. When a century has passed, all thought of our so-called speaking pictures will have been abandoned. It will never be possible to synchronize the sound of the picture. This guy won an Oscar in 1924. They did it two years later. Tom Peters, who tells us that soft is hard, which we know it's true. Tom wrote this book, In Search of Excellence. Um, it's one of the best sellers in airports, etc., of the 1980s. And he identified the companies that were performing best, that, that were most profitable, most innovative, etc. Within three years of publication, a third of those companies were bankrupt. So now, what does this tell us? Does it tell us that Tom is a charlatan? No. It also tells us that shit happens. And that, but what I think the crash has taught us of 2008 is that shit happens. All those clever, clever, clever people. And still, shit happens. So, it's going to happen to all of us, but we can deal with it in different ways. We can be positive about it, we can be flexible, or we can go and you know, hold our heads in our hands. Um, look at these people. These people all earn hundreds of thousands of pounds a year. They are men and women, and their sole job is to predict how much crude oil will sell for. And every year they produce a forecast, which is the red dotted line. Uh, and you can see in 1981 they said it would go up, it went down. In 1984 they said it would go up, it went down. In 1987, they said it would go up slowly. It, it sort of stayed flat and then shot up. 1990, they're wrong every single time. They continue to earn a fortune. But they're nearly always wrong. And this is the other great thing. The man in the street is, on average, only 5% worse than the expert in predicting what will happen. And if you need, you know, I mean, have a look at this. Yeah, well, this is probably true. I, my company and Microsoft and Apple will be very likely not around in 100 years. I won't be here to see it, but it's very likely to be true. And the reason for that is this. This is um, when we go to dig in fossils down by the seaside, and you can dig down and you can spot when the trivolites stop coming and the ammonites start or the different species come. And you can see by millions of years how often they become extinct. Okay? Now I'm going to show you the 100 largest companies in the world in 1912 of which only three still exist, they were all run by clever people like us. Those hundred largest companies in the world, when they went bankrupt over between 1912 and 1913, there's the fossils, there are the companies. Um, now, it may just be that I found two charts, and correlation does not prove causation, but nevertheless, I think it shows that we just need, you know, we don't know what life holds. Um, the crash has taught us that, and of course, humanity always fights the last battle, but it should teach us to be flexible, to try and be positive, and to try out some new things. And if we can't do anything radical, really radical, we can copy these people. We had a brilliant, brilliant, brilliant Olympics last year. And, um, you know, our cycling teams, male, female, animals, all won. It started off with the Sky team, who did brilliantly, and they were led, of course, by this man, Sir Dave Brailsford. And he's interesting because he talks about performance by the aggregation of marginal gains. What does he mean? He means that he buys pillows for his team. They all have their pillow. And when they go on tour, to help them get that extra bit of sleep at night, they all take their own pillow into the hotel room. 
they go to sleep faster. He has thought about every single part of their life, the socks they're using, the creams they put on their legs, the time they spend in wind tunnels getting just the perfect position to optimise their efforts as they go along. And ev what he's saying is make a small 1% gain here, a small 1% gain here, and you end up as a world-beating team. And anybody can do this in our organisations, whether they're just answering the phone, you know, filing stuff, we can all make these small changes, even if we aren't going to be asking permission to innovate and reinvent the entire system. And getting to a culture that keep continually does those things must be the thing that we need to do, um, as well as actually doing the work, which of course is what you're here to do too. I will shut up, I've gone on for too long, have a great conference, and I'll see you in five years when you can prove me all wrong. Thank you.